Hey there, welcome back to another video, another review. This time it's of the 1993 film The Dark Half. There are very good reasons to be afraid of the dark. And this is a very good movie. I think it is an absolute classic. I think it, I think The Dark Half is not only one of Romero's best films, I also feel that it is one of the best Stephen King adaptations. This is a film that gets a lot of shit that I personally don't feel it deserves. Uh, I think this is... An excellent movie in its own right, a really great, captivating, compelling film. It has a few prop. There's a few things that I didn't like about it, but I wouldn't even say really a few. There's a couple things I didn't like about it that prevent it from being a five star classic. But I still think it's a classic in its own right, regardless. It's a 1993 film, but it actually is a 1991 movie. It finished it finished production and completed post-production in 1991. But because Orion was in such dire financial straits, the film was pushed back or pushed ahead to a 1993 release date. So it was held back for two years, just like another Orion film, Robo Robocop 3, but I, I was having a hard time saying Robocop 3 because I, I just I, I, just thinking about that movie nowadays just gets me all discombobulated. But anyway, just like Robocop 3, which was also postponed two years before it was released, The Dark Half suffered the same fate. And just like Robocop 3, The Dark Half was also a bomb, which is really too bad. So... This was Romero's follow-up to Monkey Shines, his next film that he did with a major studio backing him, and just like Monkey Shines, it was a disappointment in the box office. And the overall impact of this film's failure in the box office was really gigantic for Romero. Uh, of course, he did some stuff later on, like Land of the Dead and so on, but he was he ended up having a hard time finding direct you know not not directors isn't the right word but finding producers to be willing to attach him to the project after this i think if he had been able to direct pet cemetery things could have been a lot different for romero and he might not have never done the dark half because because of that but he still could have done it easily because the dark half started filming in 1990 uh and pet cemetery came out in 89 so he would have if if everything worked out with the monkey shines production and things ended when they were supposed to he could have directed pet cemetery and the dark half and how awesome would that have been now the film features a screenplay by Romero, as well as two other writers, Paul Hunt and Nick McCarthy. And I feel that's another reason why this screenplay is one of the strongest that I've seen in a Romero film. Romero's a great writer, but every great writer could use some extra input or somebody else to, to kind of sw switch things up or add some things. And this screenplay is no exception. Where the film lacks, to me is with its violence. It's the impact of the violence in the film is not very high. And the reason why I feel this film was censored heavily, it looks like it was censored heavily. There are certain sequences that look like they, you'd see them maybe on television nowadays. It's talking about all these horrific acts of violence that, Timothy Hutton's character, Thad Beaumont's dark half, is doing, but you don't really see that much of it, which in, in some ways can be more effective because you can use your imagination to show you what's going on. But with a horror film like this, I, I, I just, I love to see the artistry of the makeup effects artists, and there really wasn't a lot of that until the ending, which was absolutely mind blowing and fantastic, but. It would have been nice to see a little bit more Gru, a little bit more gore. And that would have added a lot more impact to the character of George Stark. Now, that being said, though, the other only, only other issue I have with the film was its pacing. It's 121 minutes. There, It takes a bit to get going. Uh, I have to admit that. A bit too long. 
the whole dark half stuff doesn't really come into play until like 30 minutes or so into the movie. So, and it's an okay build up, but it, it, it really, it starts out with a bang, but then it kind of slows down a little bit. So it takes a bit to get going. And there are some moments where there's not a lot that happens. So it, it, the pacing could have been tightened up a bit. Uh, other than that though, pretty much everything else about the film, I really enjoy. I think Romero's direction in this is some of his best work. And there, in a lot of ways, the direction here, it kind of reminds me of the type of direction that you could see from somebody like David Cronenberg or David Lynch, Lynch especially. Uh, it has this kind of just strength. Cronenberg as well. Uh, more Cronenberg because the opening sequence when uh, Thad falls down and he gets taken to the hospital and you find out why he's been having these headaches is something straight out of a Cronenberg film. The way it's directed, the way it's edited, the way the shots are set up, the way that they're structured is so much like a Cronenberg movie. And I, I love it because I'm a big fan of Cronenberg. And it's really nice to see Romero work with a big budget. This, mil this film costs $15 million to make. And the budget is on the screen. Uh, especially when you watch the film's just absolutely stunning climax. So, this is a movie that also has some really great nightmarish visuals uh, and some very impressive cinematography by Tony Pierce Roberts and equally impressive editing by Pasquale Buba, who also edited Monkey Shines. There's a certain scene in this film, it's a dream sequence when Thad is, in a way, seeing into the future about what what is going to eventually start to happen in his life. And he's in what is the you know the 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 study the 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 extra kind of cottage home where he wrote the George Stark novels and where the film's climax is. And he's in the room and the 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 visuals in this are absolutely striking. It has this really surreal, nightmarish look to it in terms of the lighting, and this this scene where he sees his his wife, played by Amy Madigan, and he sees her tied to a chair, and she's calling his name. I, th I think she's calling his name. She's I, I think she's also saying something else. And there's this song playing in the background, and all of a sudden, her face turns to like porcelain, and then it completely shatters. And leaves behind, and what's left behind is this gruesome skull. And it, it, it just the way that that shot was set up, the way that it, it was just absolutely jaw-droppingly gorgeous in a lot of ways. It's a beautiful shot. It really is. So this film has a lot going for it with the direction, the cinematography, the editing, as well as the music. Christopher Young's score in this is some of his best work and definitely give it a listen. If you're a fan of Christopher, Christopher Young, or if you're just a fan of, of horror scores in general, it's, it's one of the best out there. It's a really spectacular score and it adds a lot to the film it adds a lot of emotion, it adds a lot of mood and atmosphere and all these other elements to raise the film to an even higher level than it already was without Christopher Young's score. Uh, and this also features a top-notch grade-A cast. you got Timothy Hutton, who really aces this role as it's a dual role. It's not an easy role to pull off, and he nails it as writer Thad Beaumont and his alter ego, his darker half, George Stark. I would have liked to have seen even more of George Stark, to be honest. That's how much I liked the performance. He reminded me a lot of Michael Keaton. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but he reminded me a lot of the type of character that Keaton would play if he's playing some kind of douchebag character. And, and honestly, that made me imagine, like, what if Michael Keaton was Thad Beaumont? That would be pretty awesome. I mean, Timothy Hutton was great in this, 
but can you imagine Michael Keaton was playing both these roles? Uh, that that could have made the film even better because of how truly talented and unique and one of a kind Keaton is as a performer. But Hutton did a great job too, and uh, this was a film that really showed me that Hutton could pull off roles like this. And uh, it was it was a really nice sight to see. If you haven't seen the film, it's definitely worth a look for Romero's direction and and. F- especially for Hutton's performance. It is definitely one of the best things about the movie. And even people who didn't like the film, a lot of critics at the time, they still gave much-deserved praise to Timothy Hutton for his performance in the film. Amy Madigan is solid, a solid uh, supporting role as uh, his wife Liz. It's nice to see her. I always thought she was an underrated actress. Michael Rooker is in this as uh, Sheriff Alan Pangborn. He's great as well. I, I, I've always thought he was underrated. Uh, nowadays, people are starting to really appreciate him because of his roles in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, which is great. Uh, he definitely deserves that. You also have some other cast members like Julie Harris, uh, Robert Joy, Chelsea Field, uh, Royal Dano, and Rutanya Rut Anya Alda. And the movie heavily features sparrows. There's a lot of the sparrow imagery in the film and sparrows. And what's interesting is is the film that has this absolutely it, it is it is a climax that when I first saw it I, I just was blown away. And watching it in high definition is even more stunning. And it wasn't really sparrows they used. They 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 had a uh, finches because for some of the sparrows were too big or they couldn't ma- manage to make it work out with the, with the sparrows. But the the sparrows are a big thing. There's a message that's featured prominently in the film called "The sparrows are flying again," and uh, so there's a climax near the end at the end where the sparrows come to take the winner of of the battle of of dualities, the battle of the halves of Thad and uh, it it is it is a masterwork of, of visual and practical effects animatronics and everything it, it, it is it is some of the most impressive work I've personally seen in that particular vein now the film also has some really fun lines of dialogue I, I love the character of George Stark. I think he has some really great one-liners. It's a character, the type of villain that you love to hate. Uh, and the performance is great, too, by uh, Timothy Hutton. So, I, I, there's one scene where there's a guy in the hallway, and he sees George Stark is up to something suspicious. And this man in the hallway just asks, What's going on? And George Stark is like, Murder. You want some? <laughs> I love, I love that line. I love that scene. It made me crack up. I, I love that kind of uh, black humor. And then he even has lines like this that actually work because of how uh, well Timothy Hutton delivers these lines. If if you had an actor who wasn't of the caliber of Timothy Hutton, would not really have been able to pull off lines like this. Like, don't fuck with me, cock knocker. And I love this line where he's like, remember, when you fuck with me... You're fucking with the best. And I would have to say, this is one, of, like I said, this is one of the best films that I've seen directed by Romero. And it's one of the best films that I've seen in terms of a Stephen King adaptation of one of his novels. Uh, the film, like I said, didn't do well in the box office. It was a bomb. It was a $15 million film in terms of its budget. It only made $10 million in the box office. It didn't end up helping Orion. It didn't end up digging them out of bankruptcy. And interestingly enough, there is there is actually a video game for this movie, which has become a highly sought-after collector's item for a lot of horror fans and Stephen King fans. It's a point-and-click kind of adventure game. And and, and, I, and when I, I remember when I first heard about it, I was just like, of all the, ga- of all the movies, of all the, the licensed games... The dark half, like it's one of those that just it, it it just completely puzzles me, and it still does to this day. Uh, yeah, the 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 game didn't sell very well, just like the movie, sadly. 
didn't sell very well in theaters. A lot of critics, like I said, they praised Timothy Hutton's performance, as well as the script. Ebert gave the film two out of four stars. He said Hutton was great, uh, but he faulted the film for failing to develop its preternatural, pre preternatural opening theme and never offering a satisfactory, satisfactory explanation for Stark's existence. I respectfully disagree with that. I like the fact that the film was as vague as it possibly could have been in terms of explaining why Stark came to be. I, I, I like that. I think that's actually more effective than trying to over-explain things. And then by the, by, in the process of doing that, you end up hurting the film because whatever explanation you come up with isn't believable to begin with. So I'm glad that it didn't go that route. I've seen people criticize the film for its ending. They think, oh, well... Yeah, uh, the the dark half got taken away by these sparrows, got pecked bit by bit, and his skeleton got destroyed and carried off, and into and his soul got carried off back to hell at the end of the movie, in a very honestly haunting, beautiful visual to end the film. But people are questioning it because, well, what about that? I mean, he still considered a suspect if people still think that he's the killer and all of that and so on how is he going to exonerate himself and yeah th th there, there definitely is a point to that but it's a story and it's a movie it's not real life and it's an explanation well how are you going to explain it how, i i know pangborn saw th uh this uh guy get picked apart by these by the swarm of sparrows, and then they flew into the sky, uh, into, like, some strange cloud straight out of, like, Ghostbusters. But, you know, he saw that, but how is he going to explain that to anybody who is his superiors? How is he going to say that with a straight face? Nobody's going to believe him. So, the film was stuck between a rock and a hard place to begin with. I personally think they should have... And, and if you want to say... Though the ending is a problem. I think, well, maybe they should have done a better job making it so Timothy Hutton really wasn't a suspect. That he wasn't considered to be the guy who killed these people. But then again, it, it, that hurts the film's suspense. So, I'm okay with it. I, I, I don't think... This is, this is a plot line that was going to be hard to really pull off and explain every little thing to begin with. So, I'm fine with it ending on a high note with Hutton managing to beat his dark half and become the victor over the dark side of his psyche and of his soul. And that's how the film ends. I'm fine with that. I think that's a very poetic way to end the film. And I thought it was a perfect way to end the film. I didn't need some prologue later that came up with some convoluted explanation as to why Timothy Hutton was exonerated from these crimes or whatever. It wasn't necessary to me. If it was for you, teach their own. It definitely was not for me. Um, but yeah, I, I know I haven't gone into a lot of detail on this, but it, I, I did. I'm doing this for good reason because I actually want people to check this one out. I want people to see the dark half for themselves, experience experience it if they haven't experienced it before, and see a lot of these things for themselves uh, and. I don't want to give away every little thing about the movie, but I, I I have always liked this film, and I've always been a big fan of it, and this is a great Blu-ray from Scream Factory. It's got a great transfer, uh, some really great... Tr uh, I, great, I, mean, I keep saying great, but it's true, great. Some really great special features as well. Uh, it's loaded with features. For a Blu-ray that isn't considered a collector's edition, it sure has a lot of features on it. Uh, a great retrospective documentary as well as some nice behind-the-scenes footage and an audio commentary track and deleted scenes and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, The Dark Half is a horror film that I highly recommend. It gets some of my highest recommendations and some of my highest ratings and my highest and best and kindest regards. And I don't know really what else to say about the dark half, except if I were to rate it out of five stars, I would give the movie four and a half out of five. Only, be, Like I said, I have some issues with the film's pacing. I, I feel that I would have liked to have seen more gore, more violence to make the character of George, George Stark even more intimidating and 
really add a lot of weight to his actions because you, you, you don't see a lot. And I, and that's a little bit of a letdown. But uh, the rest of the film definitely isn't, especially the opening sequence uh, w with uh, the brain surgery, uh, which features some really impressive practical effects, in my opinion, as well as, of course, the climax, which featured, and, and I'm going to say it again, some of the best practical makeup effects I've seen in any film. Uh, it, it, it is a tour de force of that particular art form. And I, I do feel that it's an art form. I feel that practical makeup effects, makeup effects artists, they're artists. That's why they're, they're, they are labeled artists for a reason. What they make is art, legitimate art. And the dark half has some of the finest examples of that in its climax. So yeah, thanks for watching my review of the dark half. And as always, I will see you guys later. See ya.